Hey everybody, good evening. Um, it is good to see you all. Carolyn Tibbet, I see you. Linda Dowers, hey, nice to see you. Sister Romine, glad you're able to join. Donna Kay, good to see you. Um, I'm glad y'all are here. I'm just kind of curious, um, as this goes on, I'm trying some new things. We started the countdown a few weeks ago. What do you think about that? Um, and then decided I would try maybe setting up an event um, rather than just constantly posting on my timeline. So let me know what you think. I'm just curious to see if that kind of helps because I know life gets busy. Um, and it's not always easy to remember something out of the norm. Um, so awesome, awesome, awesome. All right, let's go ahead and get started. It is about that time. And um, we've got an awesome, awesome lesson to go through tonight. I'm pretty excited about it. Um, been praying and studying and, and um, just believing that the Lord's going to speak to us tonight. Um, which is always exciting um, to think that the very God of not just the heaven, but King of the universe um, would want to spend time with you and me. And that's pretty amazing. So before we dig into his word, why don't we um, talk to him for just a minute? Will you pray with me? Wonderful Jesus. God, we're so grateful. We're so thankful that you have given us this opportunity to open up your word, to um, just explore the depths of your grace and of your mercy. What an honor it is that we get to spend time with you in your word. Jesus, I pray that you would give us ears to hear, hearts to receive, open our understanding, God, that we might understand the truths of your word. Not just tonight as we study, but as we walk in our lives with you. Thank you for that honor. And I'll praise you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Marlene Jamison, I see that you've joined us. I'm glad you're able to. Amen. Let's go ahead and get started with our Bible study. And as always, we'll start with our PowerPoint charts. We are going to talk about the birth of the church. What actually happened when the church began? We're going to talk a little bit about that tonight. So our first little section, we're going to talk about the death of a testator. Now, I don't know if you have ever received something um, based on somebody's will. But generally, the person that writes the will, the person that lays out everything that they want people to receive, they get it all laid out, they, they get it all documented, everything is good and legal, and they send it to a lawyer, make sure everything is in order. But until that person dies, all those assets, all those things that the person um, is willing to give, that remains that person's until they die. Well, it's really the same when we're talking about the birth of the church and the death of the testator. Hebrews 9, 16 through 17, and the New Living Translation puts this thought this way. Now, when someone leaves a will, it is necessary to prove that the person who made it is dead. The will goes into effect only after the person's death. While the person who made it is still alive, the will cannot be put into effect. First John 2 and 2, again in the New Living Translation, says this, He himself, speaking of Jesus, is the sacrifice 
that atones for our sins and not our not only our sins but the sins of all the world in other words when jesus was on the cross and he said it is finished the bible says he gave up the ghost and he died he is the testator. He is, according to scriptures, in scriptural terms, the propitiation or the atonement, the sacrifice for our sins. His death was necessary in order for the testament, the will, to be enacted. Jesus' death gave humankind the possibility of an inheritance, because it was his will, our inheritance that Jesus wants to give us is eternal or everlasting life. But in order to have that, the testator had to die. That's why Jesus had to die on the cross in order to enact his will there had to have been a death now within that last will and testament there was this promise this gift this inheritance or actually the bible calls it the earnest of our inheritance the promise of the holy ghost just prior to Jesus' ascension. So Jesus died, was buried. He rose again. The Bible says that he was seen of the disciples uh, within a 40-day period. Prior to his ascension, Jesus told his disciples um, to do um, something. He told them to go wait in Jerusalem. So they were to leave where they were. Mount of Olives, and they were to travel to the city of Jerusalem, and they were to wait there for this promise. They were to wait for their inheritance. We could put it in those terms, since we're talking about a testament, what we call the new testament, the new will of God in our lives. Jesus told them to go to Jerusalem and wait for the promise of of the Father, the power from on high that he promised that he would give. Let me read it actually from the scripture. And again, the New Living, New Living Translation. I, I really relied on that particular translation for this lesson because it puts it in a little bit more English terms than the King James Version does without changing really the message. So let me read Acts chapter 1 verse 8 from the New Living Translation. Here's what it says. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, throughout Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Jesus said you need to have this power. And once you have this power, then you will have the ability, the strength um, the dunamis, if we want to go to the Greek, you will have the power to be witnesses for me. Here's the deal. The disciples knew Jesus. They had walked with Jesus. They, they had a relationship with him. It wasn't that they didn't know him. But Jesus said, if I can put it in uh, more current terms, you're like a car. You've got all the equipment. You just ain't got any gas. And without the gas, you ain't going nowhere. In other words, the Holy Ghost is the power-packed fuel that gives us the ability to be witnesses for him. We need that power. Otherwise, we're not going anywhere. We must have the power of the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit, 
in our lives. Jesus said, you must have this in order to be my witnesses. The Bible tells us that after Jesus' ascension, that the disciples did go to Jerusalem, that they went to a place that is called the upper room. In Acts chapter 1, we find that in this upper room, there were 120 of Jesus' followers, disciples, if you want to use that term. It's basically the same thing, his disciples, his followers, the, the disciplined ones that um, were following the teachings of Jesus. There were about 120 of them that gathered in this place called the upper room. And for about seven to 10 days or so, they were in that room. No social distancing, y'all. They were in that room for seven to 10 days. And the Bible says that they continued there in prayer. How would you like to attend a prayer meeting that lasted seven to 10 days? Could we handle it? Think about that. But for seven to 10 days, they, they gathered together in that place called the upper room and they spent time in prayer with one another. You're really going to get into a spirit of unity, spending that much time with one another. And that's exactly what happened. So at the end of that seven to 10 day period, let's talk about what the scripture says took place. The outpouring that promised gift that Jesus said was going to happen, the outpouring of the Holy Ghost is what happened at the end of that seven to 10 day period. It was an amazing an amazing experience that those 120 people experienced. The Bible says in Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, and I encourage you to read Acts chapter 2 um, after we are done tonight because I can't cover everything, although we're going to cover as much as we possibly can tonight. Um, but I, I suggest, highly suggest to you that you read Acts, actually chapters 1 and 2 when we're done with Bible study. It won't take you too terribly long. But Acts chapter 2 verses 1 through 4 says that they were all gathered together in one accord, worshiping and praising God together. And the Bible says that all of a sudden, where they were, there came a mighty rushing wind. I don't know about you, but the other day I was sitting in my house and it began to storm and man, it literally sounded like the wind was knocking on the side of my house because it was blowing so hard. Can you imagine what that mighty rushing wind sounded like to those disciples in that room? They were sitting there. They were praising God. That mighty wind from heaven came. And the Bible says immediately following the wind, that cloven tongues that looked like flames of fire that sat upon each of their heads. Now, I thought about this. Go through the Old Testament. We read stories like when um Abraham offered sacrifices when Noah offered sacrifice after getting off of the ark and, and he offered sacrifice unto the Lord because the Lord was pleased with the sacrifice. He sent fire to consume the sacrifice. The same thing happened when Solomon dedicated the temple. God sent fire as a sign of acceptance of the sacrifice. God sent fire. Fire on the day of Pentecost. It was a holiday, special holiday that happened there in Jerusalem where they were all gathered. And as they were praying, God said, I approve of this sacrifice. I'm sending my fire to come and sit upon you to show that I am approving of your sacrifice of prayer and of worship. And that wasn't all that happened. After God sent the fire, the scripture says they were all Filled, not touched, not just a little woo. They were completely and totally filled with the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost. And when they were filled, the Bible says that they began to speak 
in languages that they had never learned, that the Spirit of God caused them to speak. They began to speak with other tongues as they were filled with the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit. Y'all, if that's the gift that Jesus said that you needed that power from on high to be witnesses, if the disciples needed it, y'all and I need it, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Let me go on just a little bit in our lesson because man, it just gets gooder and gooder as we go on tonight. So here these 120 disciples are, men and women. The Bible says that Mary, the mother of Jesus, was among the, the group that were in the upper room. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost. They were all of them. None of them were excluded. The Bible uses the term all. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues. And the Bible says that there was a crowd that gathered around. There was a crowd that heard and saw what was going on with these 120 people. Can you imagine? Can you imagine um, the thing that was going through those people's mind as they heard these different languages? Um, let's talk about the feast that was going on before we... Um, continuing this, the Feast of Pentecost, Shavuot. This celebrates the giving of the law on Mount Sinai to Moses. Now, if you go back to Exodus, what happened on the day that Moses received the law? The Ten Commandments, you and I are more um, familiar with that term. There was wind, sound, fire. And the Spirit of God communing face to face with man. You see, on the day of Pentecost, the, the feast that was going on in Acts chapter 2, it was a picture of what happened on Mount Sinai. God promised in Jeremiah that the, that the word of God would no longer be on tables of stone, but that he would write it on our hearts. When you and I receive the Holy Ghost, and I know I'm getting ahead of myself, but it's just so exciting when I think about it. When we are filled with the Spirit of God, it is like God taking His finger and writing His Word on our heart and on our lives. That is the significance of being filled with the Spirit of the Lord. Man, that's exciting to me. That's why I'm enjoying thinking about this lesson. I have just been so excited about coming to this tonight, thinking about God putting his hand on our lives when he fills us with his precious spirit. But let me get back to the crowd. So on the day of Pentecost, as recorded in Acts chapter 2, there was a crowd gathered around. The Bible says that they heard people speaking in their native tongues because there were people there from all over, not just Jerusalem or Israel. The Bible names multiple um, cultures were represented that day. But the Bible says that they heard the praises of God's being spoken in their own native language. And so they're like, wait a minute, what's going on here? What, what, what does this all mean? Because they've just come out of the temple. They've just come out of worship. They've just celebrated the giving of the law on Mount Sinai. They've just talked about the fire of God consuming the mountain. They've just talked about the wind of God shaking the mountain. They've just talked about, I mean, literally, this is what they've just been discussing and celebrating in the temple. They've just talked about God writing his commandments on tables of stone. And surely they were beginning to connect the dots as they saw what was happening to those that had been in the upper room. It's also very significant to note that the Feast of Pentecost was one of three feasts that required all Jewish males to come to Jerusalem for that feast. So, man, there was all sorts of people there. God made sure that he set forth his gift, his promise, his inheritance 
so that everybody could hear and see and be affected. Isn't that just like our God? To make sure that everybody gets a chance to see and to hear and to understand what's going on. Let's continue. So Peter begins to preach. You see, the disciples were being accused of being drunk. How in the world can they speak these different languages? Aren't they from Galilee? Aren't they from Israel? They don't know these different tongues. What's going on? They're kind of mocking a little bit. And Peter, with all the boldness of the empowerment that he had just received, gets up and begins to preach. Now, if you remember when Peter received the revelation that Jesus was the true Messiah, Jesus was God robed in flesh. Jesus looked at Peter and said, this revelation has come to you from God and could only be from God. God has given you this wonderful revelation. And because of this, I'm giving you the keys to the kingdom. And so Peter takes those keys on the day of Pentecost and begins to preach the first sermon after that gift. But I've also got to think, isn't this the same Peter that denied Jesus the night before Jesus was crucified? Isn't this the same Peter that fell and broke his promise to the Lord? Was his fall too great? Was his broken promise too much? Mm. No, not at all. Even when we fail God, and I can't speak for you other than I know that we're all human and we all fail and we all make mistakes and we all sin and we all need to repent. It gives me hope to know that Peter, who had failed so miserably, was used of God so greatly after he had repented. What a blessed promise we have that even after we fail, God can and wants to use us. Peter preaches with power. He doesn't just get up and begin to talk to the crowd. He preaches with power. He preaches with anointing and he begins his message like this in Acts chapter two. Ye men of Judea and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you and hearken to my words for these are not drunken as you suppose, seeing it's but the third hour of the day. Peter says it's just a little too early for people to be getting drunk and that's not really what's going on anyway. Peter continues his message and begins to tell that this is not just any old happening. This is the very fulfillment of prophecy, prophecy that they may have even been talking about in the temple that morning before they saw what was going on. Peter declared that as Joel prophesied in Joel chapter two, verses verse 28, we read it last week, the outpouring of the spirit of the Lord Peter says, this is the fulfillment of that prophecy. What was prophesied in the Old Testament is happening in your face, in your ears, right now, right here. And then Peter begins to preach about the death, burial, and resurrection. You and I would call that the gospel, the good news of Jesus, and told them that it was their fault that Jesus died on Calvary. Really what he was saying is that your sin is what caused Jesus to go to the cross. And so can I tell each of us today that it was our sin that caused Jesus to die on Calvary. But the story doesn't end there. Praise God. Peter does, doesn't preach the, about the prophecy. He doesn't just preach the death of Jesus. He also preaches the resurrection and the glory of the resurrection. The climax of Peter's message was that God raised Jesus from the dead. And that Jesus is both Lord or master 
and Christ or Savior. In other words, when we sin, when we fail, we're not left there to wallow in our failures. Jesus Christ made a way for us to be saved. And that's really what ends up being preached by Peter on that day. The Bible says that there were people that began to ask after Peter preached his message, what should we do then? Okay, it's our fault. It was our sin. He was crucified. We are guilty. What do we do? How do we take care of this guilt in our lives? And so Peter willingly and wonderfully begins to preach The word of salvation. It is true that when you and I are convicted of our sin, if our hearts are tender, if we are honest with ourselves, the honest question then becomes, okay, I've done wrong. What do I do? How do I right this wrong? It's all about the plan of salvation. God's plan of salvation, not man's, not a thought, not a philosophy, but the truth. What does God say salvation is? This is big. This is eternal. This is important. What is God's plan of salvation? After they ask, men and brethren, what shall we do? Because Peter had been given the keys to the kingdom. He begins to preach. And here is what he said. He concludes his message. He answers their question like this. Listen, then Peter said unto them, repent, be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Go back. Go back to the Gospels. Read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Read what John the Baptist preached. I'll tell you what he preached. He preached, repent, turn from your wicked ways, be baptized to wash away your sins. What did Jesus preach? Read it. He preached, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. The Bible also tells us that his disciples baptized those that heard Jesus preaching. Repentance and baptism was already established in both John the Baptist and Jesus' ministry. It's there. Peter's not preaching anything new. He's not preaching anything crazy that had already been established. But how beautiful it is to think that the commands of repentance and baptism, the obedient faith, remember we've talked about that multiplied times, that obedient faith leads to the blessing of God. And that blessing of God is God's great inheritance that he promised to us. That precious and wonderful gift of the Holy Ghost. That is God's inheritance to us. Peter goes on in his message in Acts 2 and verse 39 and he says, for the promise, this Holy Ghost, this power from on high is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. God didn't limit it to just those that were there on Pentecost that day. Peter, when he preached, he said, this is for you, for your children. It's forget all that. It's just for everybody. You can't put a limit on the inheritance that God desired to give. It's so cool. It's so cool. If you continue reading in Acts chapter 2 past all of that, it says that as at the end of Peter's message, that what an altar call, man. I'd love to see this. At that altar call, 3,000 people repented and were baptized. And 
we would understand according to what Peter had preached that they were received, that they were filled with the awesome power of the Holy Ghost speaking in tongues. Can you imagine what that would have been like? Man, one of these days, I'd love to see that. That 3,000 people would all come to Jesus all at once. It happens. I've heard stories, but I want to see it with my own eyes. And I believe by the grace of God um, that I can. I want to. Don't you? Don't you want to see that wonderful thing happen? So let's break down really what Peter preached that day. And uh, we're going to take it. In a few sections, we're going to talk about repentance, we're going to talk about baptism, and we will talk about the Holy Ghost. So let's talk about repentance. Repentance is the first essential part of salvation. What is repentance? Our slide shows it. To experience sorrow and conviction over past sins and a turning away from future sin. In other words, it's not, I'm caught and I feel bad. Repentance is admitting I've done wrong and saying, I don't want to do wrong anymore. In fact, it's even changing how I walk. If I've got to run away from something so I'm not tempted to do that anymore, that's repentance. It's a change of direction, not merely just feeling bad because I got caught. Now, there's a few examples of repentance. And so because of that, I'm going to refer back to the slide and just kind of walk through it while we're on the slide itself. Sodom and Gomorrah. The Bible tells us that these cities refused to repent. And because they refused, they were destroyed by fire and brimstone. If you read the book of Jonah, it's a little bitty book. It's only four chapters. It tells the story of Jonah going to Nineveh and preaching repentance and there, there's an awful lot that happens there, but let's just say in the end, everybody in Nineveh, from the king all the way down through all the animals, repented and God turned back judgment because of their repentance. As I mentioned earlier, John the Baptist preached repentance. You can see some examples of that in Matthew chapter 3 verse 2 and Mark chapter 1 verse 4. Not only that, but again, as I said earlier, Jesus preached repentance. And there's a couple of passages there. Luke chapter 13, verse 3 and Luke chapter 24, verse 47. Jesus proclaimed, I tell you, nay, but except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. And Luke 24, 47 says, and that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. We go on and we find that in the Great Commission, that was Luke 24, 47, at least one passage that covers that, that repentance and remission of sins was, was preached by Jesus. That was what Jesus commanded his disciples to take part of. We also find that on the day of Pentecost, Peter commanded, it was not an option, but he, that he commanded that they repent as a, as a part of salvation. Again, it's not works. It's not earning salvation. It's being obedient to the command of Jesus and his word. I'll say that again. It's not good works. It's not earning anything. It's about being obedient to the word of God. We must repent. The next um, few slides, we're going to talk about baptism and what that means to the believer. Remember last week when we talked about Nicodemus coming to Jesus at night? 
And Nicodemus looked at Jesus and said, we know you're a good teacher. You couldn't do the things that you do um, unless you were sent from God. And Jesus just cut straight to the to the point, except you are born of water and of spirit. You cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Jesus was referring to that water, that born of water is baptized. So let's talk about that for just a minute. What does baptism do? And again, I'm just going to keep the slide up um, for time's sake. Baptism changes our identity. Colossians chapter 2 verse, or um, actually Galatians 3.27 um, says we're putting on Christ. For as many of you has been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. Putting on Christ changes our identity. Baptism saves souls. Mark wrote, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. That's Mark 16, 16. And then he goes on and says, but he that believeth not shall be damned. In other words, the only way that you're going to be saved is you must be baptized. Um, First Peter three um, verses 20 and 21 talks about Noah. And it says eight souls were saved by water. The like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us. Baptism is necessary for salvation. Not only that, it is um, death and burial to the flesh. The Bible tells us that repentance is symbolic of death. It it, it kills and, and gets rid of the life before we encounter Jesus. Um, after death, though, somebody got to be buried. Once you die, the burial is the, is the next logical step. And Romans 6, 4 says we are buried with him in baptism unto death. Baptism is necessary. And I understand that there's there could be questions about that. And so I would ask you, text me. Send me messages through Facebook Messenger. If you've got my number, call me. We can talk a little bit more about that. But let's go a little deeper in baptism. Not only is it important to be baptized, it is necessary to be baptized, but how we are baptized is of absolute importance. So a couple of, of points about baptism. Immersion. If you study the Greek word for baptize or baptize, Baptism. The Greek word is baptizo or baptizo. I'm not a Greek scholar here, so I'm not sure of that pronunciation. But basically, it means to be fully submerged, to dip completely, to plunge. Proper burial requires complete submersion. So baptism must be a complete submersion in water. Not only that, but baptism should be performed calling on the name of Jesus. Notice there's several scripture passages here listed on our slide. Acts 2.38, Acts 8.16, Acts 10.48, Acts 19.5, Acts 22.16, Matthew 28.19, Mark 16.16, Galatians 3.27. Wowzers, that's an awful lot. So let's talk about those. Acts 4.12 says, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. There's no room for if there. Oh, Jan, but what about Matthew 28, 19? Jesus commanded, go ye therefore, teach all nations, baptizing them in the name, not names, 
name, singular, of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Father's not a name, it's a title. Son's not a name, it's a title. Holy Ghost, really an adjective describing the Spirit of God. Those aren't names. Jesus commanded that they be baptized in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. If you do a little bit of digging in John chapter 5, verse 43, we find that Jesus said, I come in my Father's name. So if the name of Jesus was Jesus and he comes in his Father's name, then the Father's name must be Jesus. Well, and we know that the name of the Son is is, of course, Jesus. Matthew uh, chapter 1, verse 21 says that Mary was to call his name Jesus. And then Jesus said, John chapter 14, verse 26, that the Father would send the Comforter in my name. The name of the Comforter is Jesus. So when Jesus commanded that we be baptized in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, he was really referring to his name. And that's how the disciples understood it. Because as you walk through the book of Acts, that's the, the birth of the church. That's the history of the church. You will not find a single time in the book of Acts where anybody was baptized in any other way than calling upon the name of the Lord Jesus. Dare you to study it out. It's there. The apostles really did obey the command of Jesus in Matthew 28, 19. When Peter said to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. When in chapter 8 they were baptized. In chapter 10, 11, they were baptized. In chapter 19, they were baptized. Paul, talking about his conversion in Acts 22, was baptized all in the name of the Lord Jesus. So, this is just something a little personal that I want to share. Do you see this? This is so cool. My sweet friend, Anita Evans, she's the one that wrote this. And I love this. This is just precious, first of all, of what this means. Second of all, because it was Miss Meter that wrote it. Yes, my real name is Janet. <laughs> Janet Ray, age eight. And that was my address. Three Fountains East Apartments, by the way. Attendant Laurel Ray, that was my sissy. June 18th, 1981. Y'all, that was the day that I was baptized in Jesus' name. That's the only baptismal certificate that I have, but that's precious to me. When the name of Jesus was called over my life, that's awesome. That means the world to me. And again, if you want to talk more about baptism, please feel free to text me, call me. I'd love to talk to you more about that. Time is slipping away. So let's talk about that precious gift of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost baptism. Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born of water, and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Jesus said it was necessary. If you're not baptized, and if you're not filled with the Spirit of God, you cannot, Jesus said. That's not my words. That's Jesus' words. You cannot enter the kingdom of God. Let that sink in. That's important. Not only did Jesus preach that, Paul proclaimed it in Romans 8 and 9, but you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his Wow. Without the Holy Ghost, you do not belong in the body of Christ. 
you must have it. When we are filled with the Spirit of God, and we'll talk about it in just a moment, but when we are filled with the Spirit of God, evidenced by speaking in other tongues, we are entered into the kingdom of God. What know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, you are not your own. That's 1 Corinthians 6, 19. Our bodies are not our own. Our lives are not our own. We are to be the temple, the house, the dwelling place for the spirit of God. We need that gift of the Holy Ghost. Peter preached it. We just talked about that. Peter said unto them, Repent, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, for the promise is unto you and to your children, and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Peter said it was for everybody. So I've got a question for you. And that's the last question on this particular slide. Have you received it? When Paul met up with the disciples of John, he asked the question. He said, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And that's my question to you. Have you? Paul instructed the disciples of John that they needed to be baptized in Jesus' name. And the Bible says in Acts 19, and when Paul had laid his hands upon them, this is the disciples of John, the Holy Ghost came on them and they spake with tongues. Let's talk about the speaking in tongues thing. Now, as we talked about a little bit earlier on the day of Pentecost, when they were in the upper room, I made note of it. All of them were filled. So the question then becomes, does everybody speak in tongues when they receive the Holy Ghost? And I know that there's an awful lot of discussion out in the religious world. I get that. I understand that that there's an awful lot, but I don't want to talk about the religious world. I don't want to talk about what scholars have to say, although they've got some great things to say. I want to talk about what scripture has to say about speaking in tongues and how it's connected with the Holy Ghost. As I said a moment ago, everybody in the upper room, all of them, were filled with the Holy Ghost and all of them spoke in tongues. Nobody was excluded. Even Mary, the mother of Jesus, had to be filled with the Holy Ghost speaking in tongues. In another passage in Acts chapter 8, we find that Philip was preaching in Samaria and says that they were all baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Um, and Philip called for John and uh, Peter to come down and pray for them. And when they prayed, something happened because the Bible says that the, the sorcerer named Simon wanted to buy the power that he saw displayed. Now, if they were just calmly without their mouth, just repeating a prayer and there wasn't anything supernatural happening, I'm not... I'm not against anybody repeating a prayer. But Simon saw something supernatural take place. And he wanted it. So he bought it. I guarantee you that they were speaking in tongues and signs were following that day in Samaria. That's what made Simon the sorcerer want to purchase that gift. If we move on to Acts chapter 10, Peter is preaching to Cornelius. This is important because this is the first time that Gentiles, people that were non-Jews, were hearing the truth 
um, of the gospel, um, Samaritans were partial Jews and partial Gentiles. So this is the first time that, um, can I say, full-blooded Gentiles were hearing the gospel. Peter is preaching to them, and in the middle of, of Peter's message, the Bible says the Holy Ghost fell on Cornelius and to everybody that was in his house, and Peter tells the story. Um, to the council in Acts chapter 11, we heard them speak in tongues just like we did earlier on the day of Pentecost. It was the same thing that happened to them. That's how Peter and the disciples that were with him knew that they had received the Holy Ghost. They heard the same evidence that speaking in tongues. So he knew that they had received the Holy Ghost because of that. Then I, I referred to it just a little bit ago. Um, when Paul was talking to uh, disciples of John the Baptist, how he laid hands on them and they spoke in tongues as the spirit gave the evidence. Y'all, every time after the day of Pentecost, when it talks about people receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost, it was always accompanied by that supernatural experience of speaking in tongues. Now we'll get into it later. Yes, there is a tongues for personal prayer language. Yes, there is a time for the gift of tongues to be spoken out in the middle of a church service and be interpreted. But as you study in the book of Acts, not every time were tongues interpreted, but it was a sign that the Holy Ghost was given. So let's talk in the last few moments of our lesson about the purpose of the Holy Ghost. There are five purposes that we're going to talk about tonight um, before we end our lesson. And that first purpose is the fact that the Spirit of God, this Holy Ghost, God's Spirit living within us, gives us eternal life. First Corinthians um, 15 and Romans 8 um, refer to this. If the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwells in you. When we are full of the spirit of God, that spirit, even if we're dead and in the grave, gives the power to raise us up to resurrection, to live with the Lord Jesus in eternity. That's an amazing, amazing gift. The Spirit gives eternal life. The Spirit also gives power. I mentioned it just a few moments ago when we talked about Acts chapter 1, verse 8, but Jesus said, you will receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost or the Spirit of God has come upon you. There is power given to us when we are filled with the Spirit of the Lord. Not only that, is that the Spirit teaches us what we need to know. I ain't always that smart. I ain't always that together. I need God to teach me and speak to me, whether it's through my pastor teaching the word and I always learn and glean from him and I'm thankful for that. But I also learn and glean when I read the scripture for myself and I spend time in prayer, my self, the spirit of the Lord teaches me and helps me to grow as I study the word of God. Romans 14, 17 um, oh, we'll get there. I'm a little ahead of ourselves. John 14, 26 says um, that the spirit would teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. The spirit teaches us. Not only that, it gives us righteousness, peace and joy. This world's crazy. We need peace. We need joy in this crazy world 
We need the spirit of God to give us joy unspeakable, the Bible would call it in in 1 Peter, and full of glory. I need that joy. I need that peace. Romans 14, 17 says, for the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. That spirit of God gives us the strength and the stamina to be righteous and holy before the Lord, to have peace in our heart and to have joy that we can't even explain when things are crazy, when life seems so uncontrollable. But here, I think, is the most amazing thing that the Spirit of God gives us. The Spirit imparts the love of God. As I was praying earlier, I began to think about the amazing love of God. This is God. This is King of the universe. The one with just a word spoke the world into existence. The one who said, I can take my ball and take it home and I ain't got to deal with you ever again. In his love and in his mercy, he reaches out to us and he makes a way so that you and I can walk with him. What love? Romans 5, 5 says, the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. When we are filled with the spirit of God, he extends and pours out his love to us. And that love really cries out, let him that is a thirst desire us come. And whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. That's the invitation of Jesus to everybody. There's an old chorus that says, it's for you, it's for me, it's for you. It's for your children and their children too. It's got something that nothing else will do. In Acts, the second chapter, you can read it for yourself. You don't have to ask anybody else about the Holy Ghost. Jesus is given away. It's for you. It's for me. It's for everybody. It's a marvelous, wondrous gift. Not only do you and I get to come boldly into the throne of grace, but it shows us that God comes to us. He is reaching out for us. What a glorious and marvelous gift. Next week, we get to go a little bit further in our study, Um, and I'm excited. I hope you all are enjoying this. I love y'all. I am praying for you. Um, And so as we end this study, will you pray with me? Jesus, thank you for your truth. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your mercy. God, I pray that the word that was spoken, that the seed that was sown would take root in good ground, Jesus, and that it would grow up and bring you glory, that your name would be lifted high. I thank you, God, because you are faithful. I praise you for what you've done and for what you've spoken to us. Thank you for that beautiful gift of salvation that you've given for us. Thank you. Bless my brothers and sisters that watch have watched this live and that will watch this even later. Bless their lives and strengthen them. Fill them with your power and your spirit. I thank you for doing it. In Jesus' name, amen. I'll say it again. If you have any more questions, text me, call me, uh, PM me through Facebook. I'll gladly talk some more about it. I love you. I'm praying for you. God bless you. Have a good evening.